For you who have been at Blaze all weekend, this is an old hat. You know Andy and his family, but for those who may not have and have had an opportunity, uh, let me at least introduce him to you. He has been at the uh, Phillips Street Church of Christ in Dyersburg, Tennessee for the past 12 years. He's about 2010. That's a long time, bro. And he is doing a fantastic job. He graduated from the Memphis School of Preaching in 07. I got to meet him uh, as I was wrapping around. What he was getting into, but yet here he is. All these years later, years later, doing such a fantastic job. I'm grateful for him, for his wife, Christy, and for their children, Kennedy and Charlie. We're grateful to have them here with us. Thankful that they were able to be here and do this. Uh, let me remind you of one thing. Uh, Andy has a, a, a heart for young folks. Uh, he finds himself being a director of a youth camp, a real good youth camp that that we have attended, and he enjoys that immensely. And when he begins to speak, listen to what God's Word has to say. Andy. Billy, the sad thing is I knew what I was getting into, and I went anyway. I want to take just a second as we begin this morning, and thank you so much for the opportunity to be here this weekend. I told the kids yesterday that it's not often anymore that I get invited to speak at youth events. I got invited more, I guess, when I was in my 20s, and I, I guess there's an age you hit when you're just too old to do it, but uh, I've enjoyed this weekend so much. This youth rally is put on with first-class effort, and uh, I know Billy and Brandy are highly involved. I don't know who else is involved in the planning, the scheduling, the implementation, uh, but you have done an incredible job this weekend hosting and working, and uh, I can't imagine everything that you have done behind the scenes to make this weekend a success. And I'm so glad that there have been as many young people here this weekend as there have been to, uh, to enjoy this time together, to learn and to grow, to build these relationships, to, to deepen relationships they have with each other. Uh, that's, what, that's what events like this are all about. And I remind our kids every year when we start our week of camp at Real Foot Youth Camp, which is close to Real Foot Lake in northwest Tennessee, that, that we're there to have fun, we play games and we act crazy and, and, and do, do all of that. But that week is about so much more. It's about growing and learning and deepening their relationship with God, but also deepening their relationship with one another. Because as brothers and sisters in Christ, that is a relationship that will span eternity. And I'm thankful for that. And I'm thankful that even though this is the first opportunity we've had to be here with the church in Hot Springs, that because of the bond we have together in Christ, this is a relationship that too will span eternity. And if I never see you again this side of eternity, I look forward to seeing you there. I want to say one other word and then we'll get started. I feel as though this is an extremely blessed church in a lot of different ways. But, uh, but as a preacher, I can tell you that you're extremely blessed in your ministry team. I've known Billy for 17 years, and, and yet we, we're still friends. It's amazing. Now, I've known Billy for 17 years. I've just met Michael this weekend, though we've been long-time friends on Facebook. And I cannot begin to tell you how, I am, how impressed I am with the work that, that you are doing together, uh, the work they're doing together, but also the work that you as the church together are doing uh, with them and your elders and and. Your reputation precedes you as, the, as you do this work here in Hot Springs and also with the impact that you're making around the world. I remember as a young child, one of my favorite times of the year was vacation Bible school. Uh, it didn't matter what else was going on during the summer, the last weekend of July every year, we had vacation Bible school. And, uh, you know, for a... For a I'd say a small to medium-sized congregation that I grew up in. I grew up in a, 
in a little church called the Bethel Church of Christ. When I was a young child, we probably had 70 to 80 members right on the outskirts of, of the town of Martin, Tennessee. And for a congregation of that size with the resources we had and you know the people we had to be involved, I feel like we put on a, a pretty good vacation Bible school. I just remember, remember as a child, I loved that week. I loved the Bible classes. I loved the crafts. I loved the time we got to spend together. I loved the cookies and Kool-Aid. But one of my favorite things about Vacation Bible School was the singing. I always loved singing the, the, the VBS songs. You know, we'd sing, we'd sing maybe one or two in Bible class on Sunday morning, maybe sing one or two on, in Bible class on Wednesday night. But when we had Vacation Bible School, we sang for a good 15, 20 minutes every single night, and I loved it. But when you're young, when you're a child, and you're singing all of those Bible class songs, the reason you love it, I think, is because they're fun songs, right? They're not like the boring adults. I say boring. I'm, I'm thinking from perspective of a young child. They're not like the boring adult songs that are sung in four-part uh, four harmony in the auditorium, out of a book. These are fun songs, right? Because they involve motion and action, and they, they provide word images and it's just a fun setting to be in. But the older I got, the more I realized that those fun songs that somebody had written a long time ago and were written in such a way to engage a young child were also there for a greater purpose. And the greater purpose was that those songs were intended to instill within us certain messages and lessons and applications that, that should be treasured and valued throughout our lives because of what they taught. And so I would think about songs like This Little Light of Mine, one of my favorites. And I would think about all the words and all the actions, and, but, but outside of just being a fun song to sing, I realized as I got older that what that song was really teaching me was about my influence about the impact that I am leaving in the lives of people around me and the fact that they can see what I do, they can hear what I say, and everything I say and everything I do is leaving an impression upon them. And the impression they are receiving from me as a Christian is also an impression they are making of the God that I serve. And so that song, while it was really fun to sing, had a deeper purpose. And the deeper purpose was to teach me that I have influence and that I need to use it to the glory of God. thought about songs like, I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. And I, I tell you the reason I loved that song was by, uh, because I loved when the devil had to sit on a tack. And I got to jump up and I could imagine the devil sitting on the tack and, and the, the look on his face when he realized the pain that he was experiencing. But as I got older and I thought about that song, I realized that that song was really teaching me a deeper lesson about the importance of making my faith personal and about resisting the devil in my life and not allowing his influence to make shipwreck of my faith as he has countless others throughout the history of our world. I think about probably one of the most familiar songs. Maybe one that shouldn't be reserved just for kids' classes. I think maybe it's one that we need to sing more often together. And that's Jesus Loves Me. And I think about how Jesus Loves Me taught me the most important lesson of all. The lesson of how an immortal and all-powerful God who created the heavens and the earth, who is almighty and all-loving and all-powerful and all-holy and all-present and all-knowing, that He doesn't just love the world at large in, a, in an impersonal, ambiguous way, but that as He looks down from His throne in, uh, in heaven, and he looks into this world, he sees not just a conglomeration of humanity, but he sees me. And he sees you. And he does, doesn't just love us as a group, but he loves us individually. 
and that He loved us so much that He was willing to send His only begotten Son to die a most horrible death so that we, though we were His greatest enemies outside of Satan himself, would have an opportunity to be saved and to go home and to be with Him for all eternity. But then, and you know where we were going all along, didn't you? But then there was this song. Probably one, I know it's, the, it's a favorite of our kids' class back home. We, we teach a, a, a combined children's class on Sunday night. And, and usually this is one of the ones that's always requested. I'm in the Lord's army. I think they love the action. They love the motion. They love the engagement. But can I tell you, I think this, this song too has a much deeper meaning. This song taught me about the greatest call to which we could possibly be called. And I'm not trying to minimize any profession in this world. There are a lot of good, noble, absolutely necessary professions and occupations in this world. Okay? But I can say with full confidence and without any shame whatsoever that there is no more noble calling to which any of us have ever been called or could possibly ever be called than to enlist ourselves in the army of God as soldiers fighting on His side. In the Lord's army. I may never march in the infantry, ride in the cavalry, shoot the artillery. I may never fly or the enemy. Folks, I'm in the Lord's army. It's a song that taught me something. An important lesson that I think we need to carry with us throughout life. But, but then as I got even older, I realized that, that even though in some respects I might have gotten away from singing this song for a short period of time, that I never really got away from songs that taught me the exact same principle. Because now, on a more consistent basis, instead of singing, I'm in the Lord's army, I may sing songs like, We're marching to Zion which has a very militant theme itself. Or maybe one that's a little bit more closely connected to our point. Soldiers of Christ, arise and put your armor on. Strong in the strength which God supplies. Strong in the strength which God supplies through His beloved Son. You look in Scripture and you see the way the church is, is pictured for us in a whole lot of different ways. You see the church pictured in terms of an endearing family. Back home, uh, all year we've been talking every single week about some aspect of how the church is the family of God and I've come to love that, that, that image of the church because we know what the, the endearment of a family means. We understand the closeness, the relationship the, the sacrificial love that we have for one another in our families. And so when we think about the church as a family, we're able to take those principles concerning family and just simply connect them to the church, and there it is. We can see what the church is supposed to be. It's an endearing family. In Scripture, we can see the church as a functioning body. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Those folks were terribly divided. And they were divided in one aspect because they all thought they were better than one another. I've got the gift of prophecy, so I'm better than you. Oh, well, I've got the gift of speaking in unknown tongues, so I'm better than you. But wait a minute, I've got the gift of interpreting those tongues, so I'm better than you. And it was like Paul was screaming at them through that letter and saying, Stop it. What you are arguing about makes no sense whatsoever because you are a body. And just like the human body has many different parts that all have different functions and different abilities and different talents, you expect all of those different parts of the body to work together to accomplish the function of the body as a whole. And he said, that's what you are as the church. You are a body. You all have different functions, different talents, different abilities, but God expects you all to function together as one to accomplish the purpose of the church. A third way the church is pictured in Scripture is as an army. 
a militant, engaging, fighting force of war. Understanding that we are engaged in an intense battle every single day, something we've talked about all weekend. And that when we choose to become a child of God, we are enlisting ourselves in a fight that is going to take the rest of our lives. And it's going to be intense, and it's going to be relentless, and we're going to have to endure hardship as we fight every single step of the way. But I've got to understand that when I choose to become a Christian, that's exactly what I'm choosing to become. Not a passive observer standing to the side watching everybody else fight. We've got enough of those. I've got to understand that when I choose to become a Christian, I'm choosing to become an active participant in that ongoing war. The fight between good and evil. The fight that its stakes are heaven and hell. A fight that's going to ultimately either cause souls to obey God and be saved or will cause souls to abandon God and be lost. Folks, I'm in the Lord's army. And I want you to be as well. And I believe that many, most, maybe all of you are. But in the time we have together this morning, I want us to to, to think about some thoughts with regard to, to, to what it means to be and why we ought to be active participants in this army of Jesus Christ. Number one, I'm in the Lord's army because I've got a fight in which I'm engaged. And to be honest, whether we want to be or not, we're involved in the fight. We just simply have to choose which side of the fight we're going to be on. Yesterday afternoon, I spoke on the, on the idea of being an enemy of the cross. Well, the reality of this this whole discussion is that if I don't choose to be an active participant on God's side, then by default, I have chosen to be an active participant on the other side. I am involved in the fight. There's no doubt about that. Every single one of us is involved in the fight. We just simply have to choose which side we want to be on And I don't don't know about you, but I know which side wins in the end. And that's the side I want to be on. I'm in the Lord's army because I've got to fight. One of the many ways Christian life is depicted in Scripture is, is as a battle, a war. We're in a fight for souls. We're in a fight for the sanctity of ourselves, for the sanctity of our family, for the sanctity of our congregations, for the sanctity of our world. But Paul would talk about in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 that this is not a conventional war and we're not even close to fighting a conventional enemy. We've got to understand the nature of our, of our war. We've got to understand the nature of our enemy. He said, we, we walk in the flesh, but we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not physical. We're not, we're not actually carrying swords and, or, or, or guns or, or, or grenade launchers. or We're not actually carrying physical weapons of warfare. Our weapons are even mightier because they're mighty in God full of pulling down of strongholds. In Ephesians chapter 6, Beginning in verse 10, he would talk to the Ephesians right before he gets to to, to listing the Christian armor. We're going to get to that in a few minutes. But before he ever gets to that point, he says this to them beginning in verse 10, Finally, my brethren, after everything that he had already said was said and done, finally be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God. And you you know what that armor involves? The weaponry. Put on that whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places.
4. Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil days and having done all to stand. There is a fight that is ongoing in this world and that fight's been going on ever since Genesis chapter 3. And that fight's going to go on until that final trumpet blows and Jesus returns. That's the begin date and that's the end date. And if you live somewhere in between, as we all do, you're engaged in the fight. Choose to be in the Lord's army. Choose the winning side. Wage the good warfare. As Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 1 and verse 18, for ourselves, for our family, for our brethren, for our world. I'm in the Lord's army because I've got to fight. Number two, I'm in the Lord's army because I've got a commander. I've got a commander. I'm not, an, I'm not, a, I'm not a commander in authority unto myself. No group of soldiers ever existed solely unto itself. Somebody, somewhere along the line, has got to be in charge. Somebody's got to give the orders. Somebody's got to come up with the battle plans. Somebody's got to oversee the operations. There's got to be a commander somewhere along the line. And when Paul talked to Timothy about this very concept, he made it very clear who the commander of this army in which hopefully we are going to be fighting is going to be. And that's Jesus. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 3, Paul told Timothy to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. In Isaiah 9 and verse 6, he's referred to as a prince of peace. In Hebrews 2 and verse 10, he's, he's called the captain of our salvation. He is the one who's been given all authority, Matthew 28 verse 18. And John 6 and verse 68 tells us there is no one else to whom we can go that has the words of eternal life. Jesus is our commander. And when you understand Jesus is our commander, that implies three very important fundamental truths that we need to carry with us every single day as we engage the enemy in battle. Number one, because Jesus is our commander, He is the one who gives the marching orders. He is the one who is the ultimate authority. And if the will of any man differs from the will of our commander, guess who ought to win? You put a lower ranking soldier in the field with a higher ranking officer, and that officer gives an order that the lower ranking soldier does not agree with, who wins in that scenario? The higher ranking officer does. Jesus is our commanding officer. His marching orders are the ones that we carry into every battle that we face. And we need to keep that in mind. Number two, as our commanding officer, we have to understand this is His mission, 1 Corinthians 3, 5-7. Now, I understand that, that we have a stake in this battle. It's our souls that are at stake. But ultimately, it's His mission. But the good thing is that His mission takes our stakes, our souls, into account. In fact, that's the entirety of His mission. It's to save us. And when we understand that we are His mission, it makes it a little bit easier to follow His marching orders. Which number three leads us to, Ephesians 2.10, the fact that as our commanding officer, He deserves total submission. I think it was Friday night, we were talking about a video I had seen on YouTube many years ago about the night that a, a group of, of Marine recruits arrived at Paris Island at the recruit depot, and it kind of carried them through the first few hours of, of their recruitment process or their, 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 their training. And, of course, the, 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 the drill instructor met them on the bus barking orders and just in their face. And when asked later why that was the tactic, you know, what's the thought process behind being so in your face? 
and so verbally aggressive. The, the drill instructor said this, and, and for those who are here Friday, you already know this, but, but this is what they said. They said, we're, we're trying to create or replicate the fog of war and break down the individual and then after we break down the individual, then we can build them back up together as a unit for that purpose. To submit to the authority of those who are over them. To understand that, that they serve for the good, not of themselves, but of the unit. And for the good of the mission. And we've got to understand the same thing. We don't follow our own orders. We don't serve our own mission. And, and so we've got to submit to the one who has authority over us. And that's Jesus. And as one who has sovereign and complete authority. And who has our best interest in mind. He deserves total and complete submission. And so number two, the fact that we have a commander in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's why I'm in the Lord's army. Because I have a fight because I have a commander. Number three, because I have the armor. He's made it readily available to me, and He's made it available to you as well. Probably one of the most visually impactful passages, I think, in the whole New Testament is Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10 and following. We've already read verses 10 through 12 where, where Paul talked about the need for us to take upon ourselves the whole armor of God. But then he goes on beginning in verse number 13 and he talks about the elements that comprise that armor and what each element of that armor actually reflects in our lives as spiritual soldiers engaged in spiritual warfare. And this is what he says, Therefore take up the whole armor of God to stand and withstand in the evil day. Have your waist girded with truth. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You know what Ephesians 6 tells me? Ephesians 6 tells me that God has provided me with every element of armor that I possibly need to not only survive the battle, but to win it. There is nothing that we need that God has not provided, and He has made that armor available to all. He's called us to a conflict. But he hasn't, he hasn't asked us to walk into that conflict unarmed and unprepared. He's given us every bit of equipment we need to fight. I think there's a reason why God spoke of these things in terms of armor. You know, you read Ephesians 6 and you think, well, well couldn't, he, couldn't He have said, clothe yourselves with, with, with all of these things? Clothe yourself with truth. Clothe, your, clothe yourself with righteousness. Or, or maybe just put on truth and put on righteousness. He could have used a less aggressive term, but he didn't. And I don't think, I don't think that's by, by accident or by coincidence. I think there's a reason why God used an aggressive militant type term in Ephesians chapter 6 to illustrate all of these important elements in our spiritual survival. Because He wants us to see this for what it is. He wants us to see it as a fight. He wants us to see it as a soldier would see it. As something that is quite literally life or death. He wants us to see it for what it is. Something that concerns either heaven or hell. And there's no greater militant way that we can look at it than through the eyes of a soldier putting on his armor. 
because folks were in for a fight. He could have chose to use a less aggressive term, but what would that, that have accomplished? It, it might have lessened the impact of the point in our minds. He didn't want to do that. He wanted to increase the importance of the message. And so he said, as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, take upon yourselves the whole armor of God. Folks, I'm in the Lord's army because my God has given me a coat of armor that cannot be touched. Which leads us to number four. I'm in the Lord's army. Now we alluded to this earlier because... Because I've got a victory to achieve. I've got a victory to achieve. Here's the difference between the armies of this world and the armies of God. When you're talking about the armies of this world engaging one another in physical warfare, the best that an army of this world can do going into battle is hope for victory. I mean, they can have confidence in that hope, but the best that they can do is hope. They can fight with everything that they have with courage and bravery. But, but still, really, at the end of the day, the best they can do is hope because there's so many other variables that they themselves cannot control. And so you fight in this life with hope coupled with confidence. It's different when you're talking about the army of God, though. Because when you're talking about the army of God, we fight knowing that the victory is already ours. We fight knowing what the outcome of the war is going to be. Remember reading the story of an old, of a, of, of an old preacher talking to a young man one day, the young man was just overly concerned about the number of trials that he was having to face and deal with in his life, and, and he just didn't know what was going to come of it all. And the older preacher was, was trying to, to encourage him, and so he looked up at him, and, and this is what he said. He said, Son, I'm, I'm happy to tell you that yes, you've got a lot going on in your life right now, but I read the last chapter. And the fact is that in the end, we still win. That's absolutely true. You read Gen Genesis through Jude, it's kind of an up and down battle, right? But you come to that last book, that, that Revelation, and you want a you short summary of the book of Revelation, I'll give it to you in two words. We win. It doesn't matter how, how intense the battle gets. It doesn't matter what trials or difficulties or hardships are introduced into our lives. It doesn't matter how off course we might be tempted to wander. The truth is that if we stick on God's side, we still win. You play out that scenario of Scripture a thousand times and the end result will still be the same. We still win. I know at times it feels like the devil may be winning. It may feel like that right now for you. I, I don't know. We might feel like all we have to live for is a life full of death and trouble. But as Paul pointed the minds of the Corinthians toward the grave in 1 Corinthians 15, he declared to them this hope-filled truth. When this corruptible has put on incorruption, and when this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, the strength of sin is the law. But here it is. And if you don't remember anything else I said this morning, you keep those last few words in mind. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
We may be engaged in the most serious warfare this world has ever seen and ever will see. But but we don't have to fight with fear, unsure of the outcome. We have the luxury of fighting with anticipation of the victory that is already ours. If only we will see it through. What a blessing it is to stand shoulder to shoulder with fellow soldiers of the cross like you. God bless you in the work you're doing in Hot Springs. God bless you in the work you're doing in this region. God bless you in the work you are doing around this world. We together stand on the front lines of the most consequential battle that this world has ever seen with our fellow Christians in arms. But folks, the devil is a relentless enemy. Even though though he's got to know that he can never win, that doesn't mean he's ever going to stop fighting. And he's going to fight tooth and nail for every single soul that he can possibly poach from 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 the hands of God. We can never let down our guard. We've got to fight steadfastly, we've got to fight courageously, and we've got to fight tenaciously, constantly looking forward to the victory. And folks, this morning, if you are not yourself yet enlisted in the army of God, we need you. Most importantly, we want you. And even more importantly than that, God wants you. And as we close this morning, we want to not just invite you. We want to plead with you that wherever you may be, if you're outside of Christ Jesus, you're too far away. And you need to come home. If you're not a child of God this morning, what's keeping you away? What's holding you back? I don't know what it is. And there might not be another soul in this auditorium who knows what it is. But the fact is, you know what it is that's holding you back from coming to God this morning. And I can tell you with all surety, I don't know what it is, but whatever it is, it's not worth your soul. Why not come this morning and receive the gift that will not just last you a lifetime, will last you an eternity. If you're not a Christian this morning, come in faith, believing Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Repenting of your sin, confessing that faith publicly, acknowledging it before us, and then be immersed in water. Well, the Bible says we, we contact the blood of Jesus Christ. Our sins are washed away. We're added to the body. We're born again in, into the family. We enlist in the army. And then we spend every single day from that moment forward fighting on the Lord's side, looking forward to the victory. Maybe this morning you are a child of God. You, you are a soldier, but, but maybe you've gone astray. As we talked about yesterday afternoon, maybe you've gone AWOL. Maybe now you're living alone without the Lord. You're like that prodigal that's gone out into the far country and you've wasted your inheritance with riotous living. But even now as you sit in the pig pen of life, maybe, just maybe, you've come to yourself and you've realized life was so much better when I was at home with the Father. And in tears, you, you want to stand up and brush yourself off and come home. And can I tell you that that Father in Luke 15 is an image of God and He's the one that even now is waiting and watching and hoping that today is the day that He sees you coming over that hill and He will receive you home with joy. If you just repent of your sins, confess them, seek His forgiveness through prayer, He is faithful and just to forgive you of all of your sins and to cleanse you from all of your unrighteousness. 
I'm in the Lord's army. And you need to be as well. And if you're not, we plead with you to come right now while together we stand and sing. Yeah.